Cassette two. Side one. Chapter five. More hard work. Thirty days after leaving Dawson City, the team arrived back in Skagway. They were very, very tired. Buck now weighed only fifty kilograms, and the other dogs were also very thin. They were not ill. They just needed a long, long rest. But at Skagway, there were mountains of letters waiting to go north. So the men had to buy new, strong dogs. The old ones, now useless for work, were sold. Two American men, called Hal and Charles, bought Buck and his team, together with the harness. Charles was forty years old, with light hair and watery blue eyes. Hal was a young man of twenty, with a big shiny gun and a big knife in his belt. These things, more than anything, showed how young he was. Both men were clearly new to the North, and its hard and dangerous life. They took the dogs back to their untidy camp, where a woman was waiting. This was Mercedes, Charles's wife, and Hal's sister. Buck watched the men take down the tent and load all their luggage on the sledge. They didn't know how to do it sensibly, and every time they put something on the sledge, Mercedes moved it. Often they had to take things off the sledge and start again. Three men came up and watched, laughing. <laughs> You've got a heavy load on that sledge," said one of them. "Why don't you leave the tent here in Skagway?" How could we live without a tent? Asked Mercedes, throwing up her hands in the air. It's spring now. You won't have any more cold weather. I must have a tent, she answered, and helped Charles and Hal with the last few boxes. Do you think that load will stay on? Asked another man. Why shouldn't it? Asked Charles. Well, it's a bit heavy on top. Do you think your dogs will be able to pull that? Of course they will," said Hal. The sledge was now ready to go. Come on, dogs, pull! He shouted. The dogs pulled as hard as they could, but the sledge. Did not move. The lazy animals! Shouted Hal, picking up his whip. But Mercedes stopped him. Oh, oh, Hal, you mustn't! She cried, pulling the whip away from him. The poor dogs! You must promise to be nice to them, or I'm staying here. You know nothing about dogs. Answered Hal, "Leave me alone. Dogs are lazy, and you have to whip them. Everybody knows that. Ask those men if you don't believe me." Mercedes turned and looked at the watching men. "They're tired, if you really want to know," said one of them. "They've been working very hard, and they need a rest." "Rest," laughed Hal. These stupid dogs are just lazy. Now Mercedes decided that her brother was right. Don't listen to that man," she said. "You're driving our dogs, and you do what you think is best." 
Now Hal used his whip on the dogs. They pulled and pulled, but the sledge stayed where it was. Hal was still using his whip when Mercedes stopped him again and put her arms around Buck. Oh, you poor, poor dears, she said. Why don't you pull hard? Then nobody will whip you. One of the men watching now spoke again. I don't care what happens to you, he said, but I'm sorry for the dogs. The sledge is frozen to the snow, and you'll have to break it out. Push it from one side to the other to break the ice. Hal tried again, but this time he broke the ice under the sledge. The heavy sledge started to move slowly. Buck and his team pulling hard under the whip. After a hundred meters, they had to turn into another street. It was a difficult turn with a top-heavy load, and Hal was not a good driver. As they turned, the sledge went over onto its side, throwing boxes and packets into the street. The dogs didn't stop. The sledge was not so heavy now, and they pulled it easily on its side. The whip had made them angry, and they started to run. Hal cried, "Stop!" But the dogs continued through Skagway, and the rest of the luggage fell off as they ran. People helped to catch the dogs and to pick up all the things from the street. They also told the men that if they wanted to reach Dawson, they needed twice as many dogs and half as much luggage. Hal and Charles went back to the camp and started to look at the luggage and throw things away. Tent, blankets, and plates were taken out. Mercedes cried when most of her clothes went. When they had finished. Mercedes was still crying. There was a lot of luggage on the road, and there was still a lot to go on the sledge. Then Charles and Hal went out and bought six more dogs, so they now had fourteen. But the new dogs were not real sledge dogs, and they knew nothing about the work. Charles and Hal put them into harness. But Buck could not teach them how to pull a sledge. So now there were six dogs who couldn't pull at all, and eight who were tired after pulling for four thousand kilometers. But Charles and Hal were happy. They had more dogs than any sledge that they had seen at Skagway. They didn't know that no sledge could carry enough food. For fourteen dogs. The next morning, Buck led the team up the street. They moved slowly, because they were tired before they started. Buck had pulled to Dawson and back twice, and he didn't want to do it again. He had watched Hal and Charles and Mercedes, and he saw that they didn't know how to do anything. And as the days passed, he saw that they could not learn. It took them half the evening to get everything ready for the night, and it took them half the morning to get ready to leave. And when they did start, they often had to stop because something had fallen off the sledge. On some days they traveled twenty kilometers, and on some days only ten. They didn't have enough dog food when they started, and they used what they had much too quickly. Hal gave the dogs extra food because he wanted them to pull harder. Mercedes gave them extra food because she was sorry for them. But it was not food that they wanted, but rest. Soon Hal saw that they had traveled only a quarter of the way to Dawson. 
but had eaten half their food. He had to give the dogs less food. It was easy to give them less food, but it was impossible to make them travel faster. Dub had pulled hard and well all the way from Skagway, but he had hurt his leg. It got worse and worse until finally, Hal had to shoot him. The six new dogs, now weak and ill from hunger and hard work, died next. Hal, Charles, and Mercedes had started the journey happily, but now they were tired, cross, and miserable. Charles and Hal argued about everything, because each thought that he was working harder than the other, and Mercedes was unhappy. Because she thought that she shouldn't have to work, she was tired, so she rode on the sledge, making the work even harder for the dogs. She rode for days, until the dogs could not move the sledge. The men asked her to walk, but she would not leave the sledge. One day they lifted her off. She sat in the snow and did not move. They went off with the sledge and traveled five kilometers. Then they turned, went back, and lifted her on again. Buck and the other dogs were now just skin and bone. They pulled when they could, and when they couldn't, they lay down in the snow. When they were whipped, they stood up and tried to pull again. One day, Billy fell, and could not stand up. Hal killed him, and threw him into the snow. Buck and the other dogs knew that soon they were going to die too. On the next day, Kuna died, and there were only five dogs left: Joe, Pike, Solex the One-Eyed, Teak, and Buck. It was beautiful spring weather. The snow and ice were melting, the plants were growing, and the forest animals were waking from their winter sleep. It was a lovely morning when the two men and the five dogs pulling Mercedes on the sledge came into John Thornton's camp at White River. They stopped, and the dogs dropped down immediately to rest. John Thornton was mending an axe, and he went on working as he talked to Hal. Is it safe to cross the river here? Asked Hal. No, the ice is too thin. It's much too dangerous, answered Thornton. <laughs> People have told us that before, laughed Hal. But we got here with no problems. Only somebody very stupid. Would cross the White River here," said Thornton. <laughs> "That's what you think," said Hal. "But we've got to get to Dawson." He picked up his whip. "Come on, Buck, get up now. Let's go." Thornton went on working. He had warned them, but he knew he couldn't stop these stupid men from going on. But Buck didn't get up. Solex stood up slowly, then Teak and Joe, and finally Pike. But Buck stayed where he was. The whip came down on him again and again. Thornton started to speak, then stopped, and began to walk up and down. Hal now put down his whip and started to hit Buck with a club. But Buck had decided not to get up. He had felt thin ice under his feet all day, and he saw thin ice in front of him. The club hit him again and again, but Buck felt almost nothing. Then suddenly, with a wild cry, John Thornton jumped on Hal. Throwing him backwards, Mercedes screamed, "If you hit that dog again, 
I'll kill you, Thornton shouted. He's my dog, Hal replied. There was blood on his face. Get out of my way, or I'll hit you too. I'm going to Dawson. Thornton stood between Hal and Buck, and did not move. Hal took out his long knife, but Thornton knocked it out of his hand. Mercedes screamed again. Then Thornton picked up Hal's knife, and cut Buck out of the harness. Hal didn't want to fight, and Buck was not worth fighting for. He was nearly dead. Hal started the sledge and went down towards the river. Buck lifted his head and watched the sledge move away. Pike was leading, and Joe, Teak, and Solex were behind him. Hal was walking in front of the sledge, and Mercedes was riding on it. Charles was walking behind. As Buck watched, Thornton felt his body with gentle hands, searching for broken bones. Buck was very thin, very tired, and very weak. But Thornton didn't think he was going to die. Then both dog and man watched the sledge as it went slowly out onto the ice in the middle of the river. Suddenly, the back of the sledge went down, and the front went up into the air. Mercedes screamed. And Charles turned and took one step back. Then a big piece of ice broke off, and dogs, sledge, and people disappeared. There was only a big hole in the ice. John Thornton and Buck looked at one another. "You poor thing," said John Thornton. And Buck licked his hand. <laughs> Chapter Six. For the love of a man. John Thornton had been ill in December. And his two friends had had to leave him at White River and go on to Dawson. They left him in the camp with plenty of food, and with his two dogs, Skeet and Blackie. Now the spring had come, and he was almost well. He lay in the sun by the river with Buck, watching the water and listening to the birds. Slowly getting stronger and stronger. A rest is very welcome after running five thousand kilometers, and Buck slowly got fatter and stronger. It was a peaceful, lazy time for both man and dogs, while they waited for Thornton's friends to return from Dawson. Skeet made friends with Buck immediately. And while Buck was still very ill, every morning she washed his cuts carefully with her tongue. Blackie too was friendly, and as Buck grew stronger, the three dogs often played games together. Sometimes Thornton joined the games too. The days passed very happily, and for the first time. Buck learned to love. He had never loved a man before. He and Mister Miller in the Santa Clara Valley had been very good friends, but Buck had not loved him. John Thornton had saved his life, but he was also a man who was naturally kind to animals. He took very good care of his dogs, not because it was sensible to do that. But because he felt they were his children, he was always talking to Buck, holding his head and shaking it lovingly. In answer, 
Buck liked to take Thornton's hand gently in his mouth. Buck was happy to lie on the ground all day and watch Thornton. And when Thornton spoke to him or touched him, Buck went wild with happiness. At first, he was afraid that Thornton was going to disappear, like Perrault and Francois. And at night, he sometimes woke up and went to the tent to make sure that he was still there. But something was changing in Buck. He had lived in the North a long time now, and he was almost a wild dog. He was happy to sit by Thornton's fire, but he sat as a wild animal, and his dreams were filled with other animals, dogs, half-wolves, and wild wolves. They seemed to call him into the forest, and sometimes Buck wanted to leave the fire and answer the call. But every time he went into the trees, his love for Thornton brought him back. It was only Thornton who stopped him going into the forest. Other men did not interest him. Visitors to the camp tried to make friends with him, but Buck stayed cold. When Thornton's two friends, Hans and Pete, arrived from Dawson, Buck refused to notice them at first. Then he saw that they were friends of Thornton's, and after that he accepted them. But they were not his friends. They were, like Thornton, kind men, and they understood that Buck loved Thornton and him alone. Thornton, too, understood Buck. One day, Buck and the three men were sitting on some high rocks a hundred meters above the river. Thornton wondered if Buck would obey any order, even a crazy one. Jump, Buck! he shouted, pointing down to the river. A second later, the three men were holding Buck back as he tried to jump. That was very strange, said Pete, when they had sat down again. Not strange. Wonderful, said Thornton. Terrible, too. Sometimes it frightens me. Yes, I feel sorry for any man who hits you when Buck's near, said Pete. So do I, said Hans. It happened in the autumn in Circle City. A man called Burton was starting a fight with another man in a bar. Thornton stepped between them to try to stop them. Buck was, as usual, lying in the corner watching. Burton hit Thornton, and he nearly fell, just catching a table. Buck flew through the air at Burton's throat. Burton saved his life by putting up his arm and was thrown onto the ground with Buck on top of him. Buck took his teeth out of the man's arm and this time bit into his throat. Then a crowd of people pulled Buck off and a doctor was called. Everyone agreed that Buck had only attacked because he saw Thornton in danger. And from that day... Buck's name became famous all over the North. Later that year, Buck saved Thornton in a different way. The three men were taking a boat down a fast and rocky river. Thornton was in the boat, while Hans and Pete moved along the riverbank, holding the boat with a rope. Buck followed them, keeping a worried eye on Thornton. They came to a more dangerous part of the river, and the boat started to go too quickly. Hans pulled on the rope to stop it, and pulled too hard. The boat turned over, and Thornton was thrown into the water and carried downriver towards rocks where no swimmer could live. Buck jumped in immediately 
and swam three hundred meters until he reached Thornton. Then he turned, and with Thornton holding his tail, Buck swam towards the river bank. But they moved slowly, and all the time the river was carrying them towards the place where the water crashed twenty meters down onto rocks. Thornton knew that they would not get to the bank quickly enough, so he let go of Buck. Held onto a rock in the middle of the water, and shouted, "Go, Buck, go!" Buck swam as hard as he could to the bank, and Pete and Hans pulled him out. It was hard for Thornton to hold onto his rock in that wild water, and his friends knew they had only a few minutes to save him. They tied their rope round Buck, who at once. Jumped into the river and tried to swim to Thornton. The first time, the water took him past the rock, and Pete and Hans had to pull him back. The second time, he swam higher up the river, and the water brought him down to Thornton. Thornton held on to Buck, and Hans and Pete pulled the rope as hard as they could. Man and dog disappeared under the water, banging into rocks, turning over and over. Sometimes with Buck on top, sometimes Thornton. When Hans and Pete finally pulled them out, both seemed more dead than alive. But after a while, their eyes opened, and life returned. That winter. At Dawson, Buck did something that made him even more famous in the North. It was also very helpful to the three men. They wanted to make a journey to look for gold in the East, and they needed money. They were in a bar one day when some of the men started to talk about dogs. One man said that he had a dog who was strong enough to pull a sledge with two hundred kilos on it. Another said his dog could pull two hundred and fifty. A third man, called Mathewson, said his dog could pull three hundred kilos. That's nothing," said Thornton. "Buck can pull three hundred and fifty. Can he break the sledge out when it's frozen to the ice, and then start it moving, and pull it a hundred meters?" Asked Mathewson, "He can break it out, and start it, and pull it a hundred meters," said Thornton. "Well," said Mathewson, speaking slowly and loudly, "I've got a thousand dollars here, and I say he can't." As he spoke, he took a bag of gold and put it down on the table. Suddenly, Thornton was worried. He knew Buck was strong, but was he strong enough? Now ten men were watching him and waiting. He didn't have a thousand dollars, and neither did Hans or Pete. I've got a sledge outside with three hundred and fifty kilos on it," said Mathewson. So. Is easy if you want to try. Thornton didn't know what to say. He looked at the other men in the bar. One of them was an old friend, Jim O'Brien. Can you lend me a thousand dollars, Jim? He asked softly. Sure, said O'Brien, putting another bag of gold next to Mathewson's. But. I don't think the dog can do it, John. Everybody went out into the street. There were two or three hundred men around Mathewson's sledge. The sledge had been outside the bar for two hours, and it was frozen to the ice, in a temperature of fifty degrees below zero. Most of the men thought that Buck was not strong enough, and Mathewson smiled happily. Shall we make it two thousand dollars? He asked. 
Thornton, Hans, and Pete talked for a minute. They had only four hundred dollars, but they added this to O'Brien's thousand. Mathewson, very sure of winning, also put down another four hundred dollars. Mathewson's ten dogs were taken away, and Buck, who could feel the excitement in the air, was harnessed to the sledge. Buck was, without question, a very fine animal, bright-eyed, intelligent, his thick coat shining with health, and he looked as strong as a horse. One man went up to Thornton. I'll buy him now," he said. "I'll give you eight hundred dollars for him." Thornton shook his head, and sat down on the snow next to Buck. He held Buck's head in his hands, and spoke softly into his ear. "If you love me, Buck. If you love me." Buck took Thornton's hand between his teeth. Then let go, and Thornton stood up and stepped back. Ready, Buck," he said. Buck pulled on the harness a little, getting ready. Right," cried Thornton. Buck pulled to the right, hard, stopped suddenly, and the ice under the sledge began to break. Now, left," called Thornton. And Buck pulled to the left, breaking more of the ice. Now, pull! Buck threw himself against his harness and pulled. He held his body low to the ground, his head down and forward, and his feet dug into the hard snow. Harder and harder he pulled. Suddenly, the sledge moved a centimeter. Two, three, and little by little, it started to go forward across the snow. With each second, it went a little faster, and Thornton ran behind, calling to Buck as he pulled the sledge towards the end of the hundred meters. The watching men were shouting and throwing their hats in the air. Buck had won. Then Thornton was on the snow next to Buck again, talking to him, and Buck had Thornton's hand in his teeth. End of side one.